Okay, so here we have a two sample problem uh, that we're going to create a confidence interval for and then conduct a t-test. That way, again, you wouldn't typically do both of these things, uh, but I want to show you uh, both of them in a single example so you can see how they connect. So first with the confidence interval, um, again, you may want to pause this to read the problem first and then unpause. For the confidence interval, it's really a matter of just matching up uh, what we what we know with the right variables. So we have two two samples. The first one is in the zapper group, mosquito zapper group. Second is in the no zap group. And uh, we have the sample sizes here, sample means, and sample standard deviation. Do make sure that you match them all up with in the same group. So you wouldn't want to put the 30 here and the 40 here and then the 12 here and the 10 here. So make sure you're consistent that all of these values are coming from the same sample. Next thing we need to do is get the T star. That's really the only part. If you look at this, this whole formula here, um, in that formula you'll, you'll have on the test, that's this formula right here. Everything is a matter of just plugging in those values we were given, except for the T star. That's the one thing that we do need to look up. Uh, so that's our critical T value. We need to get the degrees of freedom, which means we're taking the smaller of the two sample sizes. So this zapper group was 30 people and the no zap group was 40. So 30 would be the smaller. Subtract one from that and we get 29. That's our degrees of freedom. Since we're trying to create a 95% confidence interval, we go down to the chart. Uh, we can do this two ways. Because we are doing a confidence interval, we could just drop down in this 95% column. That would be a correct answer. Or if you prefer, you can think of it as a two-sided uh, test, since a confidence interval can be used for a two-sided test. And you would have alpha of 0.05 in that case. So either way, you'd be put in this column. The thing to watch out for is when you have a one-sided uh, one t-test, that's when these can be misleading. So for a confidence interval or a two-sided test, it's fine to use these. Or if you just want to be safe, you can always come down here. Uh, and That'll be consistent for anything. So two-sided, and we said uh, 29, I believe. So that would be right here. So we would find uh, 2.045 right there. And that's going to be our T star right up there. Now it's just a matter of plug it all in. Do be careful as you're typing it into the calculator. Remember order of operations. Uh, you may have heard of PEMDAS. Uh, but we do want to do these things first, then add them together, then take the square root, then multiply by T star. Um, and finally, we're going to add and subtract from negative 2. Uh, if you're not sure how to type this into your specific calculator, uh, see me and, and I can show you how to do that. So we get this confidence interval, negative 4.93 to 0.93. What does that mean in common English? It means we're trying to figure out um, the difference between the no zap group and the zap group. So in general, if people would use the zap treatment versus using whatever, they don't have anything right now, presumably, um, how many, how many uh, fewer mosquitoes, on average, mosquito bites would they get per week during while they're sleeping at night? And this would say, best case scenario, it would drop their, their mosquito bite count by almost five. Worst case scenario, maybe they get one extra bite with the zapper. Uh, so because zero is inside this interval, uh, we can't we wouldn't be able to reject the null hypothesis at the 95% confidence level. Uh, but at the same time, you can also see that our, our uh, best guess is that it does drop the count by negative two. Um, so we may continue researching this. Certainly if it was a problem like this uh, severe, severe problem, which malaria is, uh, this would show promise even though even though we technically did not reject the null hypothesis there. Um, 
And this was just a confidence interval. Notice how we, we were able to do that hypothesis, two-tailed two hypothesis test with the confidence interval. But let's go through the step-by-step -step of doing a null hypothesis test also. So step one, we get the null hypothesis itself. It's that the two uh, means are equal. So what exactly are these? This would be the average number of mosquito bites if everyone had the zapper in that Ugandan village. This would be the average number of mosquito bites if you didn't have the zapper. So the null hypothesis says it's not going to matter whether or not you have the zapper. It's not going to hurt you, not going to help you in terms of number of mosquito bites. The alternative hypothesis is it does make a difference. Even though we don't know which direction it's going in, uh, it does make a difference. So that's a two-tailed test. Critical value. Um, T stars 2.05, we already found that. It's the same exact uh, procedure that you would use for the confidence interval, the two-tailed critical value. Uh, so we get that T star in the same way. We set up the rejection region because it is two-tailed. We could reject over here or potentially over here in either direction. Calculate the T statistic for our sample. Um, again, a uh, a little bit of a brutal formula, but it's it's right there. And do notice the similarities. That part right there is our standard error, and that's going to be down here also. The difference in means you can find right here. So we might wonder, well, where is the T star in this formula? Well, it's it's setting up the rejection region. That's where the T star comes in during the null hypothesis test. So again, be careful in doing this. Make sure you do get one point. Four, three, five. Maybe do that as an intermediary step instead of trying to do it all at once. Um, and you should end up with negative 1.39. So where would that fall? That would be somewhere here. It'd be on the negative side, but certainly not to negative 2.045. It'd be somewhere here in this fail to reject region, which means for step four, when we're deciding about the null, uh, our value was not in the rejection region, so we failed to reject the null. In other words, we were not able to find strong evidence of the zapper making a difference, for better or worse, uh, making a difference in helping or hurting the number of mosquito counts. Uh, and again, that was the that was the statistical significance we were not not able to find in our sample. It did help, right? In our sample, we were, uh, we did have less bites in the zapper group than in the non-zapper group. Um, so that may show some promise for conducting further research, but we weren't able to get statistical significance. It could have just been in our sample. We didn't have enough support to say that this, this finding, this result would hold true in the population yet. Uh, these specific data were made up, but you may want to Google the mosquito zapper. This is a real thing that they're working with, and it's uh, pretty intense, especially if you watch the slow motion video. One final thing here. Is it possible we made a mistake here at the end when we, when we failed to reject and we made our conclusion? Is it possible we were wrong? Absolutely. Anytime you do an inferential test, it's possible that you're going to make a wrong decision. Um, even though we, we did what we were supposed to, it's possible that because of our sample and sampling error that we made the wrong, wrong decision. So if we did, what kind of error would that be? Well, failing to reject if the null hypothesis is uh, false, if you really should reject it, is called a type 2 error. So if we made an error, it was a type 2 error. Do we know if we made an error? No, we never know if we actually made an error or not, we just uh, know which type of error we are potentially at risk for. And in this case, we're at risk for a type two error. Why are we not at risk for a type one error? A type one error is rejecting the null when you shouldn't. And in our case, we never even rejected the null. We failed to reject it. So it's impossible for us to make a type one error here. The only error that we might have made is a type two error.